Алло. Эфир, проверка эфира. Сейчас мы видно только, только что. Я знаю, что вы попали. Нет, 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 нет. Лучше, я пока не понял, как я делаю камеру и презентацию. Лучше вот так, и на себя вот так. Если крутые, то есть я не стал глаз. Можно я могу решить сюда? Я хочу с этого... Ну, я вот тебе первую очередь. Я не знаю, что я Привет. Это привет, но ну, как понимаешь, я решил вас не мучать в этом году. А, ну, я, короче, не знаю, даже студенты, да, не знаю, куда, я еще не успел ничего прочитать, я все менее очень любила. Я собираюсь в выходные, наверное, прочитать инструкции, посмотреть, что это такое. В целом, если это, типа, очень быстро создать там таблицу оценок, то таблицу оценок, наверное, мне не сложно создать именно там, а не в офисе. Но я подумала, а я правильно понимаю, что ее не надо устанавливать? Просто на сайте. Вот. А насчет того, чтобы подавать, я не знаю пока. Еще пока выдают как есть, а там уже... Нет, подавать. Надо Thank <laughs> you. 
просто вдруг то он где-то тоже находится, когда за ней сывает. Надо, короче, ткнуть на шею вот тем железным плитом. Вот железным плитом. Железным. Да, да. Все же будет идеально, если ты где-то около слайда будешь ходить. Я сейчас Я пока Okay, let us begin with a few minutes delay, uh, not because of our fault, but anyway. Uh, today we have a talk by Sergei Bartolov. This is his farewell talk because of that one amount. He's joining Google's uh, DeepMind. So it's a great honor for our group. Of course, uh, we all wish to be success of the New York edition. But anyway, today uh, is giving a talk in our group and our seminar about one of the most promising directions in modern machine learning, so-called one-shot learning. And uh, you'll be laughing, but again, uh, we'll meet Bayesian methods here and variational inference. Uh, so it's quite interesting how uh, these techniques can be applied for this new problem where uh, it, have, uh, it has never been applied before. So, so yeah, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and for these good words. So, uh, yes, today I will talk about one-shot learning, but not in general, but in the context of uh, generative modeling, which we uh, already mm, uh, faced in our, in our seminar meetings. Um, let's begin from the from some from a bit different concept, let's talk about what is a generative model. So, you can generative model is a is anything that can produce some objects of interest. But we will talk about uh, probabilistic generative models, which simply are distributions over objects of interest. So I'll denote them by by p of x given theta, where theta are some parameters. So and you can use this uh, distribution to just sample independently objects from this distribution and this is the generative process. Uh, for example, we may consider the famous bag of words language model. This is a very simple model. I will use it just for illustration. So our object here is a text of length n and since this is a bag of words model, then each word can be generated independently of others uh, by just looking at word frequencies table, for example. Um, so we may uh, consider a bit more uh, more specific class of generative models, so-called latent variable models, where we assume that there exists a latent variable or latent description which we do not observe, but it can explain or summarize somehow the, uh, the observed object. So I will denote this latent variable as Z and uh, we'll assume the following decomposition that we have a prior over our latent variables and the likelihood given of our object given latent variable and parameters. Oh, uh, it's not you uh, who assumes, this is just a uh, standard application of, uh, product of some rule. Yes, of course. Of course. Yes, uh, and uh, we may uh, consider a slightly more uh, sophisticated example of language model, which is a direct extension of Pegaforce model. I think it's familiar to most of you. It's called Latin Let Interchat allocation. So here I have a bit unusual uh, notation, but anyway, I think it should be clear for you. So again, X, our observed object of interest, is a text of length N. And uh, Latin variable is structured now. It has so uh, there is a Latin verb, there is a Latin variable, and it is structured. First, there is a gamma, which is a document profile, the probability that a random word from this document is taken from a particular uh, topic. This is a k, let's say k-dimensional vector distributed by as by the Ushita distribution. And other parts, other parts of this uh, Latin variable are word talk word topic assignments. So each TI 
is a, uh, is a discrete, <laughs> discrete variable. Uh, when it's equal to k, this means that word number i should be, should be generated from topic number k. This is very usual. And yes, and the likelihood when we know our topics, which are again denoted by theta, and uh, document profiles and word topic assignments, they can be uh, expressed by this simple equation. So again, uh -huh, yes. And of course, this model is much more powerful than the usual Vega force model. And this is a good example of uh, planet variable models. Just like mixture of Gaussians is more powerful than single Gaussian, right? Yes, that's good. OK, so how do we? Uh, so we, we define our model, uh, and uh, we need to find the best parameters theta that explain our training data set. How do we do that? Well, we could, uh, we could use the maximum likelihood principle, but unfortunately, it's usually hard, both computationally and numerically. So we uh, today we will uh, uh, today we will talk about the variational approach for learning in planet variable models. So many of you, I think, have heard of EM algorithm. So EM algorithm is is very close to what we will uh, uh, talk about today. Um, so we will, um, for each Latin variable, we will introduce. So for each posterior over Latin variable given observed data and parameters, we introduce a variational approximation, which I denote by Q of that given lambda, where lambda is variational parameters, parameters of this approximation. I assume some parametric form of this distribution. And uh, when we define uh, these uh, variational approximations, they use automatically so-called variational lower bound to this, to this marginal likelihood. It is given by this equation. So again, I think, again, I think to many visitors of our seminars should be quite familiar. And uh, now, when we have this version over bound, we can optimize it in any way we would like, in any way we can, uh, with respect to both theta and lambda. And if our, uh, if the family of version approximations is expressive enough to capture something more or less uh, close to the true posterior, then we may hope that using version over bound as proxy to the true marginal likelihood will uh, lead us to good parameters theta. But here you make additional assumption on the structure of the variables that you have a separate P variable for each S. Of course, as I did as I did before. Yes, as I did before. Uh, I think here I here I didn't write uh, the subscripts, but okay, bold X and bold Z. Well, this is a, this uh, they belong to the same to the single object. So I just didn't write didn't write uh, the subscripts uh, explicitly. So yes, we assume that there is no. So so far we we don't assume that there exists a global Latin variable. Yes. Okay. So is this clear to everyone? Because this is the the basics of father uh, material. Okay. So yes. Uh, uh, we may also um, uh, well go deep go a bit deeper and. Uh, make another assumption or design decision that the likelihood in our model is modeled by a neural network. So uh, this class of uh, models I will call deep Latin variable models. So for example, we may consider uh, another extension of even more powerful language model, uh, where, which is controlled by a recurrent neural network or something like that. Uh, so again, Again, uh, observed object is a text of length n. There is a left variable now. By, from, by standard normal distribution. Uh, but this, but now the, but now this left variable is connected with observed variable through some nonlinear, nonlinear uh, model, which is neural network in this example. So what we so what we do here with the, the first state of uh, of uh, recurrent neural network is uh, computed using this length variable, and all the next are computed uh, by some 
transition function, which I call state here. So it depends on the previous uh, hidden state, on the previous observed object, and again, this Latin variable. So it's, it's used everywhere at each step. And uh, yes, so yeah, yeah, yes, the likelihood is expressed by chain rule in this way, uh, where the dependence, the dependence on all previous objects uh, is captured by hidden state, and it is used like we, we take this hidden state and um, somehow uh, process it through softmax transformation so that to obtain the discrete distribution over all words in our dictionary. So this is the standard <coughs> neural language model with letter variable. Yes, and parameters here are simply, well, uh, implementation of these functions, need, state, and f, which is the transformation from hidden state to uh, distribution of rewards. So such model allows us to convert uh, our text to vector representation in the space of Z, right? Yes. yes. So some, some analog of uh, variation autoencoder, but for text. Yes, yes. I, I use, so I, I just said that we, often we use some examples of, uh, from computer vision, and it will be a bit more interesting to see uh, examples, to see examples from other fields such as NLP. And this is correct. Uh, and uh, I appeal to all students from uh, Varansov Group. Are there any? One. Just one. Uh, this is a good alternative to what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I advise you to, to pay attention to this model uh, because it, it also allows to, to build some big representation for text and to solve the problem which Ransov uh, dreams to solve. Uh, so it's a, at least it could serve as a baseline to, to your technique, so maybe uh, you will show that this technique is better and then you will switch to it and improve it. Yeah, so. the problem is that the, this kind, kind of models is hard to learn. Uh, it's not hard to learn. I know that recently some papers appeared where authors claim to solve this problem. I don't know how yet, but yeah, just to inform you. Interest. Yes, so as I said, we defined a nice model, but how would we learn the parameters? Well, Sorry, this is, yes. A question. Yes? Can you give an example uh, where you can inject the latent variable into the current neural network cell? <coughs> I'm talking about the. Yes, you formula. talk about this, yes. Yeah. Do, do you ask uh, why this? Could make sense to, to use Latin verbal here? Yeah. Do you know the example where you can inject the noise into the, the cell and how you can do that exactly? So, as I said, well, this is uh, the very general like description of, 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 of the model. You can, well, I know that DeepMind recently released a paper where they claim that they could successfully do that. I know that this is hard. So, yeah, this is known to be a hard problem for some reason. Probably because standard uh, problems with uh, recurrent neural networks are mu multiplied by uh, randomness, which is uh, which is caused by this uh, variable, which is also something I don't know. Uh, but this is a matter of training. In fact, uh, this particular recurrent neural network assumes that um, Z is known for us. Uh, well, yes. At this at this point, we assume that it is known. Yes. yes. So the, the difficulty is only with training uh, when Z is unknown. And here we are using inference network, and uh, uh, we obtain this stochastic computational graph, and there are all some difficulties. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, but again, so this light variable can capture many things, such as some topical information about what this text should be, I don't know, some maybe uh, sentiment information, well, many things could be captured there. Yes, so yes, as uh, we just uh, as we, as we just mentioned, uh, mentioned there is a problem in how would you train these models, and the, uh, the so the answer is that we will again use rational inference uh, for for this uh, with uh, set with a very interesting uh, again design decision that our rational approximation our approximate posterior uh, is also will also be modeled by neural network. So this is called as variational autoencoder because the left variable is a code and each part is modeled by a neural network, so it's like an autoencoder. 
and it's trained by virtual inference, so what? this is why it's variational. So this is the standard, uh, the, the very abstract uh, computational graph for uh, for uh, variational autoencoder. This is the generation part. Usually we have we use just a normal standard normal distribution as a prior over our latent variable, which is then transformed by some neural network. It may be very small or it may be very big and deep uh, to obtain to obtain the distribution over uh, over x over our observed object, and the recognition part is usually just a re uh, the reverse of the generation part. This is uh, somehow uh, connected to the analysis by synthesis principle. Yes, but maybe this is not very important right now. Yeah, uh, and uh, it is interesting that the recognition part here. So in the end, we are trying to make regression over parameters for normal distribution, which will serve as uh, the variational approximation. And of course, no one, it is, we don't know if the true posterior is normal or not. Uh, there is some evidence that it's not normal. So there are some extensions on how to reach this, uh, this approximation family, but they are not uh, related to today's talk. So I, I'll, I just, I just mentioned that there are some some ways to improve this uh, approximation. Oh, but yeah. Do you agree that uh, any unnormal distribution can be converted to normal by nonlinear transformation? So Wait, at some point, I remember so last time we tried to discuss this, we spent one hour. <laughs> and yes, let's let's uh, leave it for for the end. I, I get, for now, I can agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is this is tricky and a bit philosophical question. So okay, well, and now our observed variables are dependent on each other. Yeah. Uh, where 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 are they dependent? So here they're independent. In in the in posterior, yes, they are probably dependent. No, on the previous previous slide, we show that uh, yes, p of x is equal to w is depends on previous values of x. No, this is x. x bold is your observed object. Okay. And normal x is just, well, here, you can say that x bold consists of many little x's. Okay. Yes, so they which are words, but the whole object is x bold. <laughs> so here, I don't, uh, uh, I don't uh, describe what are the observed objects and what are the left variables. This is just so this is a conceptual form. Yes, this is a concept, not a particular model. Yes. So, since we defined uh, both the generative model and the recognition model, the variational approximation, again, this will induce the variational overbound of this form. and. Uh, Actually, if we are using uh, normal distributions as as approximation family, uh, we may uh, some, we may obtain uh, Monte Carlo estimates of the variational bound quite easily and with small, probably the smallest possible like uh, variance by so-called optimization trick, which is based on the property that if you have a vector which is distributed. By some normal distribution, you can apply in a fine transformation to it, and the result of this transformation will again be distributed uh, normally, but with with certain parameters which are given by this transformation. So here we generate some noise from standard normal distribution, uh, apply the fine transformation given by sigma. It can this can be a matrix. Or, or like the general matrix or just the diagonal matrix. And then we add some bias which corresponds to uh, which corresponds to uh, the mean value of normal distribution and the result of this transformation will be distributed exactly as uh, as parameters of our original approximation. So using this so-called representation trick, we may derive the Monte Carlo estimate of the variational bound and use it for, let's say, for training or uh, quickly estimating uh, stochastic gradients, for obtaining stochastic gradients and training the lower bound with respect to parameters of 
our model and rational approximation. So is this clear? No. <laughs> no. From from which part did I lost? Like the connection between the last four and the last slide. Okay. Okay. Yes. Probably this is my fault. I should explain this. In, uh, yeah. Better. So the idea is that we have this objective, and we would like to optimize with respect to theta and phi. Okay. Uh, but we cannot compute at least this expectation because even though this distribution is known to us, uh, all the, the analytical expectation uh, given by this distribution of some nonlinear function, well, it isn't known. We can't compute it analytically. So we need to express, so if we want to use stochastic gradient descent, or ascent in this case, we need to obtain some Monte Carlo, we, we need to uh, convert, we need to obtain it as a as an expectation, so that the true gradient, the true gradient is an expectation of some stochastic estimate, and we can do it in multiple ways. First way is to name the sample from this distribution, and consider uh, this, and consider some nice, quite nasty well equation somehow relative to this, uh, or to use the preposition trick where we sample from standard normal distribution and then well, like by, by this property when after we apply this information to the noise uh, the result is distributed as we wanted but as uh, distributed by q uh, my also yeah sure and long remark so see uh the first line we need to uh compute uh, derivatives gradients with respect to phi and theta the problem is that uh, we can't first uh, remove this integration this expectation with monte carlo estimate and then compute derivatives. This is very attractive, but uh, this is wrong. Yes. Because our distribution, uh, with respect to which we compute expectation, itself depends on phi. So we can't first sample from it and then differentiate the uh, results uh, with respect to phi. We need to differentiate the uh, distribution itself. Sorry, it's another Okay. <clears throat> so, and the idea here, uh, let us first get rid of uh, parameterization from distribution with respect to which we can build expectation. And this is called the parameterization tree. So we remove uh, distribution Q of the I uh, with distribution Q over Q or not Q? Oh, with, with distribution with respect to XO. This distribution uh, is no more dependent on phi. And all dependence on phi is now uh, hidden in this function G. And the function G appears with this point. I guess we should just write down all the formulas. Yeah, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm doing. So, so uh, instead of Z, so, yeah, so what? I finish and then you, you, you explain the expression, okay? Sure. So, instead of uh, those Z, uh, we substitute function G which is a function of epsilon. This is our random variable with respect to which we can build expectation. And this uh, the distribution on epsilon is no more dependent on phi. That's not mm -hmm. me. <laughs> so we remove this z with respect to fun uh, function g. And then we obtain the expectation with respect to distribution, uh, which, which is not dependent on, on either theta or phi. And we obtain here functions of theta and functions of phi, because all uh, these z's are now dependent on, on phi. And we can differentiate it easily. So we first uh, remove this integration with a Monte Carlo estimate, and then we simply uh, differentiate. With respect to both yes. Is there any need to derive this exactly? Uh, in the blackboard? Okay. Taking expectation against uh, complex distribution, we replace it with another one which doesn't depend on phi. Yes. That changes our integral. Now we can differentiate inside the integral. Without yes, exactly. Because otherwise, the expression for the standard for, for the gradient will be will look like this, and it, it, it can be shown that this expression has a larger variance than this estimate. So orders. Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's variance uh, scales linearly 
as a dimension is dimension out of like variables. Since it's usually a big number, we, we would like to avoid uh, grains of this one. But they can be used with many with not not just with normal distribution, but with any kind of distributions we use for first for uh, approximating our posterior. And this trick works generally with very small family of distribution, so-called location scale family. Actually, for the family where this is true, sort of. And uh, normal distribution is the most famous and convenient from this family, so this is why we do it. Okay, so this is our Monte Carlo estimate, which we may use for, and we can easily uh, use it to compute the lower bound, or we can use it to compute uh, stochastic gradients and uh, optimize the original objective and thus learn our relational autoencoder. So is everything clear at, the, at this point? Okay, sure. Okay, so this was uh, the relevant, the recent, the related work section uh, of the paper you might, of the feature, or of our feature paper, and now we are describing more or less uh, original ideas. So, what, uh, so, so far, as Dmitry suggested, mentioned correctly, we assume that data points are distributed uh, independently and identically. Uh, so every time we generate some, we generate some object using our generative model, we, we just independently sample from the model. But what if we relax this assumption? Why does this make sense? Well, if you are, uh, so if you are, uh, if you want to, let's say, classify objects uh, and you have never he heard of these objects before, you've never seen them, uh, but after, let's say, five, well, after you observed five objects and labels for them, you realize that you're dealing with fruits and around the apples and oranges, then this may improve your classification uh, performance for future objects. This is the intuition. Uh, and uh, clearly, they after you know that there are only after you know that there are only oranges and let's say and uh, what it is apples, then they are uh, independent and identically distributed. But before you knew that, they they may be dependent for you for you observe that fact. And uh, this actually can be illustrated by a very famous definitive theorem. Which is uh, one of the foundation, which is partially foundation for Bayesian methods. It says that if our data points are so-called exchangeable, so that if we apply a random permutation to the data points, their joint distribution doesn't change, uh, then there exists a global latent variable such that, given that variable, they are independent. They are independent. Uh, so this is uh, why Bayesian methods make sense in theory. Uh, at least this is how I explain this to, to, to myself. And um, so again, we, so yeah, so this is one way of relaxing the ex what? Sorry? I'm told that you don't like this theory very much. Yes. For years. It is strange that it is not, uh, in, in, uh, it is absent in many like educational programs. Although it's super basic and important. Maybe you are overestimating it. No, not, not just me. Yeah. Okay. Not just me. Okay, so this is one way of relaxing this assumption. And another way is to, well, directly, um, if we have n, n objects, we can rewrite the joint distribution over these n objects uh, by the chain rule in this form and directly directly model each of these distributions, each of these conditional distributions. So these are two, uh, two uh, ways of uh, relaxing this assumption. No, but uh, the last way is just, uh, this is general form. This is general form. I, I just I said that we will model each of these conditional distributions, and by this, and by this we will define the joint. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Can you repeat the conditions of the theorem? So if, uh, our data points are, I think, generally it's required, can, I think generally can be that n is like infinite, 
like infinite, but I'm not sure. But any, anyway, for any finite n, if these axes are such that after applying random permutation to them, to any permutation to them, the joint distribution remains the same, then they're called exchangeable. And for exchangeable random variables, there exists, uh, well, for the following is truth. There exists such a Latin variable alpha that given alpha, all of them are independent. And alpha may be also uh, of infinite dimensionality. This is important to know. Yes. <laughs> but with your example with oranges and apples, they do not correspond to this exchangeability. Why? Because if you see, for example, five objects and they are all oranges, it means that all other will be kernel apples. But here, the exchangeability and probability is the same. Excuse me, I didn't So exchangeability is about is about that order is not important for us. Yeah, yeah. Suppose we have we see one one orange and one apple. Yes. And then a set of oranges. Uh, here we can predict that there can be apple and oranges in the future. But yes. suppose we have all the oranges in the first set. Yes. And and we think our model should see that apples are not impossible are not possible but they actually exist so the probability will be different so if only train data that is available for us is let's say oranges only oranges or only apples then very likely that we we will believe that only them are possible but so i'm just saying that if if i want to classify or if I want to classify some objects, then the order is probably not important for me if this is not a speech recognition problem or something like that. And the fact, so, okay. So yeah, here's the example. You, you the task is to classify fruits. I don't know the fruits in advance, but I know that the, the order in which I will classify these fruits is, is not important. Uh, I can walk into the room and look at them one by one without remembering what I have seen so far, and this will be independent predictions. Do you agree that this is uh, this is uh, worse than if I will take all the fruits, look at them all, try to understand how they are uh, constructed, well, their their colors, their smell, and so on, and use this information to classify them jointly? Yes, but this does not correspond to exchangeability property. Why? I think that this corresponds because the order of them is not important again. Then they are exchangeable. Then there exists some latent property which may, which may explain the whole this, the whole um, sample. This is exactly what definitive theory means. The alpha will be different classes. Well, in my example with oranges and apples, alpha will be that there are oranges, apples, and they look like this or they smell like this, their properties. Well, this really depends on the model which we consider. But the idea, but the idea is that alpha are some global properties of our sample. So should we discuss this more or we will further? I think that Dmitry is right. This is more philosophical question. But uh, you have all mentioned your arguments. Okay. That's good, but I think the, the main motivation is still one shot learning, which can be explained without this definitive theory. <laughs> the main <laughs> as far as I understand. Uh, I don't understand your <laughs> So Yes, we may not use this, we may not use the definitive theorem, but it can be, as we will see a bit later, it is very useful. Well, this particular uh, form of the joint distribution can be useful for a bunch of learning. Okay. So, excuse me if I uh, mention this uh, with no reason. Yes, so one model uh, which is, um, so yes. So one model which uh, uh, falls into one-shot, well, generative models is sequential generative model of Daniel Rosenda and his co-authors from DeepMind, 
it was published on the last ICML, I think. And it is an extension of draw model, which you may have heard of. And uh, um, well, it's 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 in, internal structure. It maybe is not super relevant for us. Uh, what is important that in this model there is an ability of conditioning on some input image to generate an image which looks similar to that original image, but maybe with some transformations defined by latent variables. So in the normal regime, this model is trained as any variation of the encoder, but with some very special structure. It, it has attention, it, it focus on, focuses on different parts of image and draw on these parts, uh, which gives, the, gives this model certain expressive power. But from some abstract point of view, it's just variation of the encoder. But what is interesting that we may condition both generative part and inference part on some uh, object X prime, which is used as a, as a sample to start from. Uh, and uh, well, it can be described by a, a series, uh, by a sequence of transformations to the, some virtual canvas, which is then on the final step of this drawing process transformed into the uh, into the final image. So as I said, this may be not very important for understanding. Well, the bunch should learning counterpart of the stock. But yeah, it's just just an interesting example. And let's look what this can well why this property is useful. Because we may after we train this model in let's say uh, IID regime probably uh, we may condition it on some some images which we have never seen before. We've only seen some um, some some just some other symbols, some other ch characters from the same assumed distribution, but not exactly these characters, absolutely. And then we may ask the model to generate new characters. And as you may see, well, these characters look quite similar to their um, to their original like, samples, which is very, which is quite good. So this model conditions only on a single object, which may be not, uh, which may which may be not very impressive, but still even conditioning on a single object it can produce a new lots of new objects, which is an interesting property. So another model which is relevant to this talk is so-called neurostatistical. I think I made a mistake here. Neuro statistician. Statistician. It, it is. Yes. So it's the correct one. Okay. Neurostatistician model. And in fact, I'm very jealous that I was not the person who wrote this paper uh, because the idea I think is really beautiful. So it exactly implements the definitive theorem. It assumes that there exists, uh, there, there, there are some local left variables Z, and also there is a global left variable C, C for context. And um, uh, this, this uh, global context uh, somehow summarizes the summarizes the well the the sample uh, summarizes yeah the sample the, these these objects. The recognition the recognition model for this uh, model looks this way. So again, we want to uh, so the version of observation decomposes in the following way. We first try to estimate the context, the global properties of our data set, and then using these global properties, we try to we estimate uh, we model distributions uh, for Latin variables. So, and maybe my example with apples and oranges is not very uh, uh, is not very good, but here, if but we may return to these characters, and let's say that we want to model some character again. If we look at five characters and collect some global properties of this public character, let's let's say that well, it's something like a circle or like an oval with maybe some sticks out of. Uh, to explain your example with uh, apples and oranges. Sure. So assume that uh, we have seen lots of apples and we know that uh, this is a kind of fruit. 
Then we have seen lots of oranges. And we also know that this is a kind of fruit. So uh, we uh, somehow learn the concept of fruit. Here now I've shown just one pear. We can, <laughs> we can easily imagine how other pears should look like. Because we know that this is also fruit. Now we are, we are changing our problem to say a uh, car recognition problem. Well, we are showing we are shown lots of bikes, not motorbikes. Then we are, uh, we are shown lots of limousines. Uh, and we saw how long the concept of a car. We are now shown just single truck. Truck. Uh, we can easily understand how other trucks should look like, because we know that these are also cars, and we have learned already the concept of a car. Here is another example. There's a set of uh, different hieroglyphs. Uh, after learning uh, several types of these hieroglyphs uh, using large samples, we may now easily you know, abstract types, and we may now easily uh, learn new hieroglyphs on the fly. So just from one or two or maybe three examples. We can easily understand how uh, the hieroglyphs of this new type should look like. And this is the idea of one of learning. And uh, this is why this uh, C variable arises. So the variable that which encodes the context. Yes. So this is the context. Uh, in, the, in the first example, this was the context of a fruit. In the second example, this was the context of a car. In the last example, this was the context of a hero. So the, the uh, model itself is very general. Yes. It can easily uh, adapt itself to, to the particular concept. And within this concept, we may easily uh, perform one shot learning of a new type within this concept. Maybe um, Bifarish is very right, and especially in that, that this model is very general in the theory. In the theory, in the theory it, well, it can it should be much more powerful than any of existing variational encoders. Uh, so, but how do we train this model? Yes. Uh, and am I right that uh, if C is a context of fruit, then Z, Z is a uh, like an apple and banana, yes? Or, or this depends on how do we specify the model, but for example, let, let's say that there, there is only one it, kind it of fruit. Okay. Let's say that there is only one kind of fruit. And C is that, uh, well, this is, for example, apple, it's nearly round, and uh, it weighs about this, this much, and it should be, let's say, red or green, not, not, not black, probably. Uh, and that is can gov um, governs the local the local transformations which may apply to this general portrait. Mm -hmm. For example, it may say that well, this can be uh, it can be not exactly round, but in a bit this like shape, or it may weigh a bit more than in general. So Z is, is a local variable. It, it belongs on the it it helps you to provide variety over. Uh, new apples and C governs the general properties, <laughs> but not of apples. The general property of fruit, no, because we're showing yes, yes, yes. If we assume that there are only apples there, so then we will not be able to, to, to learn new concepts of pear. In order to be able to learn it, we, we have to see yes, different types of fruits, and so C should encode that fruit is is something which is uh, relatively small, relatively round, so yes. this is not a car. Yes, example. yes. Uh, and if you have a uh, different type of, of fruit, uh, C then uh, constant the context of uh, that is the fruit. Mm -hmm. So uh, the confusion, the potential confusion of why do I uh, always use the example of only a single and particular kind of fruit is that because this model is trained only a single class of of let's say characters or fruits only on single class of objects. So in theory, this this model can model everything, but authors consider the following training protocol. I think after I explain it, some things may be maybe a bit more uh, clear to you. So let's assume that our end data points is a data set and there is a distribution over data sets, <coughs> all possible data sets. And of course if any of these, uh, any of objects in the data set, well, are independent of others. There is no, uh, there is no need in uh, this uh, global context variable. But we assume that there is some dependency between them, which we encode in the distribution. And we want to 
uh, maximize the expected likelihood of any possible data set generated by this assumed data set distribution. Uh, so it's intractable and we use racial inference. There's nothing new, it's just uh, the exact form of the variation over bound that is used uh, for training. And the distribution is constrained in a way that all objects in this all objects in this uh, data set are belong to the same class. And alpha here, what is alpha? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, alpha C? should be C. Alpha C. should be C, I, I apologize. <laughs> yes. So in this, so yes, as I said, in theory, this model is very powerful, but the particular implementation of these distributions is such that the model can adequately wor work only with a single class, model only single class. This is why that we are doing something new here. So we will uh, relax this assumption a bit later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yes, it can and it can deal with a single class. Yes. But since we have uh, many different data sets, we somehow learn different classes. Yes, we learn how to learn. Uh, yes, yes, we learn how to learn. This is correct. So how these definite things uh, are related to one shot learning in a Bayesian approach. So suppose that we have observed a data set and we want to generate a new object as if it was given in that data set, as if it should be similar somehow connected to the data we observed. And by uh, by an integration rule, by some rule, we may express this, this distribution in this way. So we first, if there is a context variable, context global variable, then we may consider the posterior over this global context. Let's say sample from this posterior, plug it into our likelihood function, and obtain uh, and obtain the sample. But this is only true if uh, exchangeability property. Uh, really. Yes. 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 Well, I th no. Well, actually, in this form, this is true even if there is no exchangeability property. But no. Because uh, you are mute. Oh, oh, yes. Let's give and see. And there should be. Well, yes, yes, yes. So exchangeability property tells us that in theory, something. So the model in this form should exist. It should model our data correctly. But since uh, we don't we don't know how to compute this uh, posterior distribution, we again use uh, our rational approximation uh, instead of it. And the, the so. Everything in this model is the same as in convenient autoencoder, but this global uh, variable is something new to us. So let, let me uh, illustrate how this distribution is modeled. So we observe n, n data points and objects, and we want to obtain the distribution over context. How do we do that? Well, there is a special neural network which extracts some statistics from each object, and then they are averaged here, or some other pooling performed on, the, on these statistics. And then these statistics are used to compute uh, distribution, the parameters of normal distribution over C. Uh, and this form is nice, this form is nice because well, it's relatively general, and it is actually, well, the property of exchangeability um, is correct because of uh, this average operation. So if, if I apply a permutation to access, then the result will be the same, which is a good property and not exactly, which is not exactly true for our model. With, well, but I'll talk about this later. So this is a nice thing, but clearly if, if this distribution uh, is modeled in this way, then if access are from really different classes, there is no, well, a, a version of, of, of different of their statistics makes very little sense because if each x belongs to its own class, we extract statistics, we average them out. Well, in the limit, there is not no useful information for us in this. Uh, the, the data points on which we condition and black samples, black images are samples from this distribution. So as you can see, uh, the nearest statistical model successfully generalized on the fly from from these five examples. So it, it, it can never seen it during training procedures? Yes, yes. If 
have never seen it during training procedure. This is important because otherwise, well, we know that there are good genetic models for characters uh, if, uh, from, from the training set. But here, uh, it was trained on different, on some other characters. So this means that uh, you could draw five hieroglyphs of your own, mm -hmm. for example, which you have just invented, and neural statistician will continue producing a similar looking hieroglyphs. Exactly, exactly. Yes. And now I will describe what we have done. So we use a bit different approach. We don't assume that there is a global like, variable. Uh, at least so far, and we we uh, are trying to model uh, the joint distribution over the data set uh, by a chain rule in this form. So we assume that in order to generate the next data point, we explicitly, we explicitly condition on all previous data points. And I have a question about the previous one. You keep showing the algorithms of characters which are generated from one example. Can you explain a little bit more why is that impressive? I mean, why can't I just do a model which uh, learns the parameters, like I draw over the image that I'm given, and I don't draw a lot, yeah. and I don't change all the pixels, so why is that not what happens? Yes, so the idea of function learning is that, well, okay, let's consider the computer vision domain. So in computer vision, we have very good classifiers, but they're trained on very large data sets such as ImageNet, where every category every class is annotated by lots of people there are at least I don't know how much at least a thousand let's say examples for each class but there are many situations in which uh, it is very uh, hard it's very expensive to manually uh, label data points or even to provide uh, to, to provide even unsupervised data as in this example so we want to train models which can learn on the fly by just conditioning on, on very few examples and do not uh, and do not overfit from them, because if you if you will take a convenient, let's say, uh, how's this called, generative adversarial network, which are very good generative networks, and draw five symbols, draw five symbols and ask to train on them, it will just remember them. It won't be able to produce new examples of the same images. So this is why it is impressive. No, I'm sorry. I understand the importance of function planning. Yes. I just don't understand how do you explain or prove that this model with its results doesn't do something very simple. Like one learns, it learns that it shouldn't change what it's given as a input very much. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, the answer is quite it's pretty simple. Just look, say, on this image. It has changed all pixels of uh, among these. And what about the thing transformation? So uh, it has generated something completely new. So you can say that uh, we have changed just a small subset of pixels and uh, kept all remaining pixels the same as, as, as they were uh, on training set. So we produce something completely different uh, in terms of pixels, pixel wise difference, but something conceptually very, sim uh, very simple to. Uh, to I still can do that with a fine transformation, right? Yes, you, you can, but you will have to include knowledge. Of this fine transformation to your model, and here, uh, well, here. I mean, I, I can believe that the paper does something useful, but it's just not clearly seen from the example. Okay. Uh, do they have so, enough examples? Not on the characters. Uh, they have lots of examples in, in their paper. I just uh, get the characters because my own experience are also. I mean, do they have something more sophisticated? Oh, wait. Uh, they have, video, they have video, uh, like screenshots from some from some videos. So this is more hard. But but okay, I can. So you are right. So these things are easy to learn. So yes, you can uh, apply some random, some affine transformations and maybe some random pixel inversions, and this will be a decent generative model. But and that's okay. <laughs> but the idea is to learn this this procedure. So in this example, it is relatively simple. But yes, you may consider it much, much more difficult task, but when, for example, with naturally looking images, where, well, where uh, one should, one should generative models do not work well so far, but uh, when they will, this will be probably approved. You know the paper about generating chairs, right? 
Yes. Yeah, so those examples are much more impressive. I'm not sure. I mean, they're probably not about the same thing, but if you add examples like those, it would be much more uh, precise. That, that's true, but why? Uh, so but that's true, but that's much much harder. And here we're trying to to investigate into principles, not not to build a nice industrial yeah. system. Yes. Uh, what is the resolution? The resolution? Yeah. Uh, these are, I believe, 28 by 28. So the original the original images were quite big, but they are down sample to a uh, resolution for convenience. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there, well, does this model assume some sort of controlling what we are exactly generating? I wonder if you've seen the paper when uh, some guys from Computer Vision Lab uh, used some operations in order to rotate faces, to rotate faces or to change light or something like this. Do you ask if the light variables are interpretable? Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know. I think so. Here, we, we don't enforce them to be interpretable, so they don't have to be. But I believe that if there are some techniques to make them interpretable, you can apply them to this model as well. No, we could uh, carry out some, some experiments. Yes, of course. It's, it's, it's really it, yes, it's we should, an interesting question. We will do that, but yes, the short answer is what I just thought. Um, I think we have uh, uh, some sort of global question. I want to mention that uh, we have uh, some machine uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, does uh, some physical experiments in the form of, uh, for example, a curve. We try to I think that marker is good. Uh, which is that? Okay. Let's uh, mention uh, uh, that we have. Uh, uh,
uh, some sort of uh, physical experiment. And this is uh, uh, time, and this is velocity. Uh, okay, uh, this uh, machine is very big and very expensive. And uh, I can only do uh, five or six experiments, uh, which give me uh, the points. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, can I use uh, one-shot uh, generated modeling uh, to produce uh, uh, a low uh, velocity uh, in this part of uh, time uh, with uh, such uh, small amount of data. Well, if you have not only these data, but a set of these data sets, each data set may be small, but you have many of them, then yes, it can. And authors of this paper have very similar experiment. They, can see, they take MNIST, MNIST images, uh, digits, and <coughs> sample pixels from them as, as if it, it was uh, points in a part in a 2D path. So let's say this is a two. They consider the data sets of these four. So these are uh, points in two-dimensional space. And the idea is that can 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 this model then uh, interpolate and put new objects here, here, and so on. So they they have a positive answer for this question. So probably if you have many of these data sets, then it's possible. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, another question. Uh, um, another question about uh, this, uh, this problem. Um, uh, let's imagine I don't have uh, such such data sets, but I have uh, data sets that are that are that look, look like uh, that, but uh, they depend on some external variable, for example, temperature, and they look like. Well, I think you can do this. Let, let me talk about it later after the talk. Okay, please. Guys, uh, let us ask all questions which are related to your particular problems you are working over. Uh, just after the talk, not during the talk. One more question. Yes. Uh, what was the training data? Uh, it's not clear for me what was the training data. Wait, can you explain a little bit more? Yes, uh, yes, probably I should do that. Yes, uh, there is a data set which is called Omniglot. And, uh, it's sometimes referred to as transposed MNIST because in MNIST you have 10 classes and how much? Let's say 10,000 objects for each class. And here the situation is the opposite. You have uh, maybe several thousand classes and only 20 examples for each class. So if you want to, so you, can, you will, most of the classification systems will overfit on this data set. And this is why it's used for one shot, for evaluation of one shot learning systems. Uh, this, uh, this is one of the test classes which, which are not present in, in the train part. So you can so if your model overfitted on trade part, it will not it will, it will never generate uh, anything reasonable. It's condition conditioned on on this test class. And what was in the training data? The same. Maybe you already said about this, but also 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 some characters from well, Omniglot is a database of uh, some hieroglyphs and all the alphabets in, in the, on the earth. I think it's question more not about the data set, but about the training procedure in the previous slide or previous screeners, I don't know. Yes. So, so we have uh, several data sets. And each data set is 20 pictures of one symbol, yes? So the, the tier data set is, is uh, we uh, artificially, artificially say that our data points are organized in a data set. Mm -hmm. It is not the data set we used for training. It is the data set we define for ourselves. So in Omniblock, it's in one data set, one, one symbol, yes? It's, it's characters of one class. Mm -hmm. Yes. For example, uh, this could be your mm -hmm. data set, mm -hmm. and this could be your data set as well. And am I right that when you say that your points in your data set are not independent, that means that they are from one class? Yes. 
in this particular model, in this particular experiment, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, so our assumption is that we will observe data points from the same class, yes. Okay, so we will now discuss uh, our original work, uh, which I, which is now called generative match networks, but I'm not sure maybe the name will change. Uh, so it was inspired by the recent paper of Ariel Vinyos and his co-authors from DeepMind, where they extended, uh, extended the paper, which, uh, which was uh, the paper uh, meta learning with, uh, with memory augmented neural networks. Uh, which I'm proud to be co-author of, and uh, showed that it is possible to construct very efficient and very simple one-shot learning, one-shot learnings. But their work applies only for uh, only for uh, supervised problems, and uh, uh, I adapted this technique to well, we with uh, approach adapted this technique to uh, to unsupervised generative models. So as I said, we will consider the following uh, chain rule-like decomposition of the joint distribution. And we will model this distribution and this distribution. So, and our recognition model will look in the, will look in the same way. Uh, actually, I forgot here the x, this should be x less or equal than i. Yes. So let's talk about it. How, how is it constructed? So let's begin from the generative part. So we, are, we observed k images, k objects, which we may be not from the same class. We don't need this assumption. And we want to generate something which is which looks similar to them. How do we do that? Uh, first, we generate some noise from the standard normal distribution. Maybe not standard normal, but so far let's assume it's standard normal distribution. After that, it is it is converted into some feature space by a fully connected network. Uh, we also convert each of the available data points to the same feature set to the same feature space by function f. So function f is for conversion into feature space. And here I, I write f prime because the source, the domain of this function is not uh, the observed objects, but this Latin variable uh, space. Then I ask myself how how similar are each of these features to the feature that corresponds to my latent variable value, uh, and I compare them by using so-called attention kernel. So I compute cosine distances between uh, between feature between two feature vectors. Then I transform it by softmax to transformation to obtain. Uh, valid distribution over over uh, these uh, objects. And here I also have a pseudo input uh, there for the case where no data points are available for me when I generate a uh, data point from scratch. There are, you may think of it as a pseudo image, which is here, but there is no image. There are only pre-trained feature vectors and yeah, then feature vectors. After I computed this attention kernel, After I compute this attention kernel, I use the weights from the kernel to average uh, some parameters associated with these objects. And then I use this average as, a, as an input to the generator. So what is the idea? As you've seen in the neurostatistician model, they seem to average, average uh, statistics from each object they condition on. Here, I know that my objects may belong to different classes that may be quite different. So I, I don't need to average average over them with the, with, with the same weight. I should provide more weight to the objects which are more similar to what I'm going to generate. And this is the basic, uh, the basic variant of the model. In fact, in our experiments, uh, the, the prior for that variable also dependent on the input on the uh, input data points. Yes, so this is the idea. And uh, there, uh, and yes, by doing this, we obtain x. Uh, 
which has a conditional distribution given z and given all previous axes, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, I didn't write this. I should I should write that that also that also um, uh, there is a path from z to x here. Explain more about parameters. Yes, yes. So I call this yes. So there are two types of features. First features are used to compute similarity between uh, data points and my uh, my plan of the new data point. And uh, parameters are second type of features. They are used to actually produce data points. So the idea is that there should be different types of features. One to discriminate between data points and others to generate the data point. Uh, in fact, I'm using, right now they are the same. This is why I, uh, these, I wrote these uh, arrows, and these arrows are dashed. But they should be two different types of features. Yes. Right, so, so in this context, what is through your input? So my blue, my blue dream is that uh, there is a network which extracts the exact parameters for the generator, the, parameter, the base of the new network. And they are averaged with base that corresponds to similarity of uh, of the input and the desired object. So I call them parameters because I want them to be the exact parameters of my neural network. So that when you can when you condition on completely different data points, the parameters of the new network are also completely different. This is the blue dream which is not implemented yet. And this is actually the variable z which decides on what. Uh, objects x, x to, to, to pay attention to. Uh, yes, implicitly, implicitly, yes. And the recognition part is very similar. So again, uh, what I have k input images, k input objects, and the new object, and I want to uh, infer the let variable that corresponds to this new object. So how is this done? Again, I convert this data point to the, some feature space by using the convolutional network. By the way, this is the first time I wrote convolutional neural network by myself. For years I resisted from doing that and I gave up finding it. So yes. And again I compute the similarities, average average parameters with uh, this value. What is PSM the input? Again, see the input is a object which is absent so suppose that uh, here maybe see the input is not needed but i decided to leave it to make models like uh, more uh, similar so it, it is required if there are no input images here oh, mm -hmm. so where there are no input images you should either you should have some it's, it's like bias it's like bias yes and you can have not just one see the input, you can have many of them well so this is uh, a big problematic part, actually. Yes. Uh, yeah. well, am I right that you need pseudo inputs in order to work with different like, length of the data set, right? Yes, if to include zero, uh, data sets of length zero. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, how do I train this model? So this model is trained in the same way as a neurostatistician. Except that, well, the distribution from which I sample my data sets is not restricted to be uh, to, to contain only a single class. Uh, and in, well, in current experiments, number of classes, of maximum number of classes is two, so it's possible to put images only of uh, one class or on images from two classes. But I will show that, mo that model trained on C equals two generalize well to the case of three different classes. So it really, so there is some hope that it will generalize even more and more and more. So this is a very uh, preliminary result. Okay, let's look uh, at the numbers. So first the rows are our model, generative match network. FC is for fully connected variant and conf is for convolutional uh, variant. And each column here is the expected per likelihood of a data point when you already observed a certain number of previous data points. So here is, so this column is for 
the normal regime for uh, IAD regime for uh, rational encoders. And this is the, the case where we allow ourselves to condition on one previous image, here on two previous images, and here on nine previous images. Uh, so let's see. First, which is very good, that the more data we observe, the better we can model future, uh, future objects. This is very good because for free, you can, you can have nine nets difference for free. Nine nets is a lot in uh, at least on Omniglot, so this is uh, this is promising. Uh, and both with fully connected and with convolution network. Uh, and with convolution network, difference is even 10 nets, which is also good. And it all, it's, it's also nice that here, as I said, we train it uh, on data sets of two, of up to two different classes. And when I change in test time the maximum number of classes to three, it still works. Numbers are a bit worse, but this is okay because uh, there are less information for each class than if it was two, just two classes. Uh, is it for convolutional or fully full connected? For convolutional, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes, and uh, well, there are some baselines uh, which, uh, to which I compare. First is Iway, important with alt encoder, and you can see that, well, it's slightly outperformed by the fully connected version, but only because it has more parameters. But well, I weigh is a well is a thing that can improve your results by almost no cost. So you just use I weigh objective instead of normal uh, lower bound, and uh, your results are better. And you can see that it can be improved by looking uh, nine objects even more. So this is a good result. Uh, there is also the sequential generative model from uh, Danila Rosenda and other smart people who, for some reason, don't uh, publish the likelihood for the condition variant of their model. So we know that uh, the, the samples are good looking, <laughs> but there is no likelihood or even lower bound obtained for computer for this experiment. So I don't know how to interpret this, but okay. This is a very strong model, which used not a convolutional network by a special, but a special tensional mechanism. It's really, uh, it's really specialized to only got like data. And look, we can improve it well by a certain, by a certain number. Oh, well, but we're improving even for the first attempt. Uh, this is the lower mm -hmm. bound. Ah, oh, okay. so so the, it is a bit strange. They, I heard that. Uh, that for draw-like models, the lower bound and the likelihood are very close, so the the gap is small. But I think this number was so, so good for, for for the authors that they didn't even bother with computing the actual likelihood. And this, I think this that, is my interpretation. I think that they haven't provided uh, additional numbers because uh, there have been no baselines compared. Uh, no, the only baseline was for there, the there is, a, there is a paper of Ruslan Selkudinov. Who actually, the yes, well, the only glove was introduced by this paper. So, in theory, they could compare with them, but their code is in MATLAB. I couldn't run it, so I don't know. Uh, yes, so it's a bit uh, unfortunate that uh, the newest statistical paper didn't have, has no numbers at all in their paper. This is very strange. They have very good samples, uh, and I'm surprised that they didn't want to. So, the, they're based on the visual feeling. Yes, yes. No aesthetic feelings. Yeah. So this is why I think it's a good time to publish this because there are no numbers to compare with. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, but, uh, but we may uh, sort of uh, have a feeling of what is good and what is bad, at least. Yes. Am I right that I weigh raw is just usual fully connected version of the Yes. Order? But with yeah. special... But it's with special order bounds. Mm -hmm. So it is some improvement of variation out in court. Yes. This is just to give a, an order of what it should look like. Yes, now the samples. Samples are creepy. But, uh, yes, I, I will first let you to judge how creepy they are. So this row is the uh, 10 objects I allow myself to condition on. And the rest are samples. Uh, the the row or the column is not relevant here, so they are all samples from from the distribution conditioned on these wide images. Yeah, 
yes. So you can see that there is a this symbol, which is quite uh, easy, looks like shock uh, letter from Russia, mm -hmm. and we may have many variations of this. And there is also like transpose U, which with certain, <laughs> which with uh, certain uh, success may also be reproduced. Yes. <laughs> it was very good idea to do it like this, I mean, the picture, because uh, before you said that... Uh, oh my god, I'm sorry. The rows and the... I don't know, it, and columns doesn't matter, it's very... And you said it's creepy, it's very creepy. <laughs> okay, sorry. sorry about that. But as I said, this is my first evolution in the network. So uh, I believe that architecture can be improved a lot. No, no, I mean, you simply need to, like... Uh, okay, explain yeah. something. Yes, sure. Rearrange the picture. Huh? Rearrange the picture. Yes, probably. In, in, in what way? Here the columns and the rows do not matter. So they're not related with the <laughs> work symbols. Yeah, okay, I will do something with that. <laughs> yes. This is another uh, example. <laughs> yeah, you may. Uh, yes. So, samples are more creepy than than from neurosystemal model, for example. But again, I, I use much more uh, simple confnet to both to recognize and to generate, and and I can condition on uh, different classes, which was not possible in statistical network or in. Um, or on the model of, from DeepMind. So I believe, so this is the actual contribution. So network uh, can perform simultaneous one shot learning of several instances. Yes, several classes. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is another example, also creepy. And this is an amnist example. So, so it is interesting because this is the trans sort of transfer learning because of course there are some digits in Omniglot data set, but there are only two, there are only 20, 20 instances for each digit. And in Omniglot, there are much more operations. Some of them are bold, some there are some cultures more like redated. So yes, and when we see that this uh, transfer somehow succeed. So it, it reads digits here just as a new type of hero. Yes, actually. exactly, yes. And it tries to, to generalize from the knowledge it has about how hero uh, may, may change. Yes, exactly. So they are not just copies of this, this data. <laughs> this is and another example. This and one, here there are three classes, right? Two. Or, or two? Two. Just sevens and two, twos? Yeah, and this. Yes. Well, we need to work more on visual quality, yes. Um, what was the engineering, I guess, problem for doing the smaller two classes? The original problem? Uh, why only two, why not three? 